So now you're you're we're, you're going through a officer candidate yeah, yeah. school, mm -hmm. and obviously there's probably more of an emphasis on leadership, yeah, training and qualities mm -hmm. and so forth. But would you like to tell us anything about that schooling? It was um, it was uh, it was probably one of the best things that ever happened to me in regards to this is where I think academia now made sense. This is where for me personally things started to click that I knew that um, I had this ability to lead and train and I had a, a passion about that especially for something that I enjoyed doing that didn't really involve the classroom. But um, to become a Marine officer like every Marine is an infantryman. There, there's no way around it. You could be an air traffic controller but if you can't pick up an M16 and get it down range or call in an airstrike you're not a Marine. Uh, so the Marine Corps Officer Corps emphasizes that uh, to the unbelievable degree. So you, the entire time you're in the Marine Corps uh, Officer's Candidate School as a warrant officer, um, it's all infantry. Everything you do is all about infantry. It's night na navigation, it's calling in air packages, artillery packages, um, doing uh, performance evaluations on all of your Marines, Marine Corps strategy, Marine Corps doctrine, heavy classroom theory, um, getting together with study groups, studying, then doing the test, um, and both academia, but then you're out in the field at four o'clock in the morning and, and you're, you're out in the, in the, in the field all, all day long doing patrols, doing ambushes, all kinds of live fire kind of things. Um, it was, uh, to me, it was just uh, an absolutely thrilling event. Okay. Um, and that was an entire winter. Again, it was a tire, I think it went from January to April, May, May, May time frame an unbelievable event. Were the instructors, did they have a different attitude towards you as candidates versus say, you know, the, the folks that are recruits in boot camp? Um, it, it was much different than that because we were already Marines. And, uh, and the beautiful thing about that is um, we call it the basic course um, because every Marine Warrant Officer in there all come from the enlisted ranks. And then your, your instructors were captains and majors. There was no lieutenants, everybody was captains and majors and all of them were experts in their field, artillery officers, combat infantry officers, intel officers, um, interrogators, these type of things. So these, these men um, had been in the field, had been in the fleet, had forward deployed to become instructors at this. So there was none of the uh, derogatory, in your face, you know, kind of nothing like that. It was very, um, you know, Doug, it was almost as, it was, I was introduced to probably at this point, the whole British model of the, the military officer. Very uh, professional, high level of etiquette. Um, at the end of the day, a cigar, a cigarette, and a beer. Mm -hmm. You're not getting drunk, you're not, you're not chasing, you're not doing any of that stuff. It's a very uh, prestigious position. When you work all day and you're totally grimed out, you gotta get cleaned up, you gotta be back down to the officer's, uh, officer's mess mm -hmm. uh, at a certain time for a, a a, a plated dinner, um, which was so foreign to, to us enlisted guys. Mm -hmm. You know, you'd be lucky to get a paper plate and you got mm -hmm. a thousand flies over it at the same time. Mm -hmm. And then you wind up at Quantico. So that's more what Quantico was like. It was almost, uh, it was an infantry officer type thing, uh, but very, very finishing mm -hmm. in the sense of that type of British military etiquette. Mm -hmm. uh, mess nights, dining in, dignitaries coming in. Um, high level of people coming in from the White House um, to the Department of Defense coming into our school. We would have a formal dinner in your dress whites, mm -hmm. a lot of customs, courtesies, those type of things. And is that really part of what you're being evaluated about oh, is absolutely. not only your what you do in the swamp at four in the morning mm -hmm. or calling in mm -hmm. this and that, but yeah. your uh, sort of your status not only as an officer but as a gentleman or mm -hmm. something like that? Absolutely. So. Um, just to fast forward a bit, so I left that school, and you're at, to answer your question, it's exactly what it is, because now in the real world back in the fleet, um, I get called in to Okinawa, Japan. There's a uh, three-star general, General Knutson, I believe at the time. He might have been a two-star at the time. And uh, a pretty big shot in the entire Far East, all Marine forces in the entire in the Far East, and he says, Murph, we just had a Harrier go down in the remote aspects of the Philippines, and, um, and I need you to get a team together and I need you to get in there um, and I need you to find the pilot, I need you to find the plane and we need to get them out of there quickly. Um, there were some people in the Philippines who were um, 
uh, not so friendly towards the United States, um, a, a terrorist type of organization who were threatening the U.S. Embassy, um, and uh, extreme hot spot. So I'm, man, Doug, I'm 32, I'm guessing at this point, 32 years old, and I am the senior officer going in there. Uh, get a couple C-130s, get a team, get translators. Uh, I got SATCOM guys. I get, again, 20, I've been doing this my whole time in the Marine Corps, so now I'm just at a whole different level. I got a Marine Expeditionary Unit sitting out in the, uh, in, the, in, the, um, in, the, in the ocean out there. I can call in gunfire, naval gunfire. I can do whatever I want at a tip of a mic. And we get down there. Um, and so to answer your point, I have to be a gentleman because I'm dealing with the embassy and the, of the U.S. And the, and the Philippines. I'm dealing with um, uh, the, the, the Filipino um, national military dignitaries. We, we got to get this jet. We've got to get this pilot. He happened to divert in an old World War II uh, runway mm -hmm. that a town had built itself up all the way around this runway. Had the Harrier left like Harriers normally do, the vertical takeoff and landings, mm -hmm. he would have blown up that runway. He lost an engine uh, type of thing. Um, and, and so the whole point is I had to defuse the whole situation. I had to get in there. I had to get my, the Marines to be able to get the jet, get it fixed, get the pilot, get him safe, get it all out of there. And we had to do the whole thing in 72 hours. Mm -hmm. I had to be the mayor. I had to be the guy who had a, a whole bunch of cash to be able to pay off whoever I need to be able to pay off. All these things went into this little tiny operation, again, mm -hmm. post-Kuwait, Desert Storm stuff, pre-9-11, but mm -hmm. these are the real world things that you're dealing yeah. with all the time. And I think what I experienced at Quantico took my small unit leadership to the whole next level mm -hmm. to be able to deal with foreign dignitaries um, and defuse situations and, and make sure that that didn't get ugly. Right. And this was the time of uh, the sort of history when a lot of the bases in the Philippines that have been there for decades and decades have been taken out. Taken right? out, yeah. The Marines were being... This uh, is post-Marcos yeah. and all that stuff. Yeah, so. yeah, exactly, exactly. So you don't want an international incident no, on your hands, no, but you need to also no, take care of business. No. So, uh, uh, Yeah, it was a, it was a, uh, it was a daunting experience. Um, I, I was very confident in everything we were going to do, but I did realize that one wrong move, one wrong, one wrong look or gesture, um, towards our hosts, which were the Filipino people there, which most of them love the, the U.S. and the servicemen especially. But then the, the times have changed, and there's a lot of people who um, saw what was happening, especially when I come in with two C-130s, as this U.S. military buildup. Mm -hmm. And the, the threats against the embassy were real, and mm -hmm. the weapon systems they had were very real. When I picked up the SATCOM and I'm talking to the commander of the MU, and he says, Murphy, anybody even looks at you runway, you tell me and I'll have whatever you need on that flight line. Okay. Um, you're dealing with a whole lot, yeah. And were you with, uh, in, in this whole process, with the 4th Marine Expeditionary Brigade, is that correct? Yeah, that's okay. where, uh, that's where that time, those kind of events that I dealt with, and I could sprinkle this conversation with those kind of events that were World World is where, um, where, um, where the Marine Corps at that time saw the writing on the wall. There was more and more terrorist incidents taking place. Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. Kobar Towers, um, the USS Cole, versus mm -hmm. various attacks come up. And the Marine Corps said, we've got to stand up an anti-terrorism unit to be able to deploy it worldwide, um, to be able to do a host of, um, of things from taking over embassies to supporting an embassy if an embassy hostage situation take place, all kinds of things. And, and I had built myself a reputation and be able to, to think very quickly on my feet. Again, the basic things that I learned in boot camp, that I learned at home, that I learned in high school, brought it all together to be able to get into foreign countries and do mm -hmm. some things very, very quickly. Okay. So I became an, an operational officer for that 4th Marine Expeditionary Force anti-terrorism mm -hmm. that specialed on, specialized on responding to acts of terror and also um, getting over, this is 99, 2000, 2001, getting into embassies pre-9-11 and helping embassies to assess how quickly uh, they could respond to acts of terror. Okay. Yeah. So were you stationed around Quantico and then you could go anywhere at that point? What or? they did is they brought us back down to the uh, two MAF, the Second Marine Expeditionary Force. So the force is the entire division, the wing, the whole thing that comes together. We're a component of that. Back down to Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. Okay. And at that point, that's where uh, 
it was really a, an, it was a fascinating unit. We did uh, heavy support for NORTHCOM, North, North American um, uh, Potential Acts of Terrorism. Uh, we, we literally um, worked at events like the Presidential State of the Union addresses, the uh, President Bush's inauguration. Uh, Pope John Paul supported him, literally went from, this was a great winter, whatever the winter was, maybe it was, um, maybe it was the winter of 99, I'm guessing. Um, so President Bush does a State of the Union. We, pre we pre-positioned, if you can imagine from Camp Lejeune, we pre-positioned close to a thousand Marines within miles from the, uh, the Capitol. Um, we had worked with the Capitol Police. We worked at all the forces within that area that if something were to take place, we could very seamlessly bring these Marines in to support some sort of long-term terrorist mm -hmm. incident on Capitol Hill, especially when you have the president, presidential succession. Secret Service does an unbelievable job of the presidential succession, president of VP. We picked up from the Speaker of the House on this whole continuity of government mm -hmm. and the continuation of government operations. So think about Murphy, New River, you know, dealing with four people, Iwakuni, uh, 27 people now. We got thousands mm -hmm. of Marines pre-positioning all different kinds of specialties from mm -hmm. from various things, and uh, and we've got to make sure that this State of the Union address, in the height of things in the world, that high probability of terrorist incidents. We were, if you remember, in the nation during time, we we're being probed all over the place, mm -hmm. mostly in the Middle East. But then you had the Tokyo subway bombing with the the, the sarin gas. All these things were mm -hmm. going on. High probability of something taking place like that. Mm -hmm. So we pulled that off, and uh, which was an event free, um, you, and that's the world I lived in. You never know whether you're 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 leaning forward with your force protection prevented something happening, or if you just got lucky enough to take place. But then mm -hmm. we get a phone call that next day, said we've got to get out to St. Louis. Pope John Paul is is coming in, and now there's heavy th threats against the Pope against the entire city of St. Louis. Again, now it becomes what's called a national special security event. Okay. And I think I had referenced Bush at that time, but it was the Clinton administration. E earlier, the presidential state of the union mm -hmm. was, was uh, President Clinton. Now it's President Clinton, Vice President Gore, it's the Pope, many dignitaries. You got mm -hmm. everybody in line that if one good terrorist does what he's gonna do, you've just knocked out half of presidential succession. Mm -hmm. So I've got to get out there with two other Marines, and we get the St. Louis hook up with the, the FBI, and do the exact same thing that I did in the Philippines, um, and plan this whole thing to get all these Marines now from D.C. into St. Louis and pre-position them to be able to respond if needed. Which means you're pre-positioning through the Basilica, mm. the entire city. This is back when cool movies are coming out, where satellites are doing satellite imagery. You know, Will Smith did a movie with Gene Hackman. I forget what the movie is, but I, I, maybe it was Will Smith. I forget who it was. But all the satellite mm -hmm. imagery, we had all that stuff in real time. And I remember, okay. this is just like the movies. This is so cool. Okay. And we pre-positioned all those things from the movement of where the Pope, where the President, where they're going to hook up at the airport, had everything down to a, a, a footstep and a time hack of where they were going to be. Um, okay. So this is, these are the things we did in the States which again then was all preparatory for what set my world on fire in, in 2001. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if I understand correctly, you're, you're sort of coordinating things remotely from Camp Lejeune? Remotely from this Camp place Lejeune, and then we get out, I was an action officer, so I'd be on a plane and I'd fly here, I'd fly here, I'd fly there, okay. whatever the event might be. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we're training these Marines. We're mm -hmm. constantly, we take them to Canada, we take them over in the Middle East, we're, we're constantly training with other units, with other special forces mm -hmm. from from Marine Corps fast teams uh, who do quick reactionary force kind of things to kick in doors and those kind of things. Mm -hmm. We're working with all of them. Um, and then we were focused in on NORTHCOM, but we always had a Middle East mission at the same time. Okay. So yeah, we would be bouncing all over okay. the United States. So you're sort of in the, in the forefront of sort of our pre-9-11 sort of approach to oh, terrorism, pre which is sort of- Homeland Security, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, and then how did the events on 9-11, mm -hmm. September 11th, how did that impact mm -hmm. you and your team and your, and your mission one of and the, so forth? Um, one of the greatest opportunities I had was uh, in, in 2000, was to work heavily with uh, the, uh, the fire department in New York, FDNY. Uh, mayor Giuliani was the mayor at the time, and he essentially uh, opened up his city to us to train in urban environments. Again, the, the, to put this in the historical context, even the uh, New York subways were being 
were being hit with terrorist opera, uh, terrorist hits, you know, whether just, you know, hand grenades going off in the subways or various things happening. I mean, we were being probed, and that's what this whole unit, the Marine Corps, stood up to work with. And the unit had to be able to work in a joint environment. So when you bring um, the uh, the Air Force AFRAT team, who are radiological kind of people for dirty bombs, mm -hmm. to uh, special units within the Army and the Navy, we had to be able to work with all these, uh, these units. And um, so we worked heavily in New York City. And it just happened to be the chief of special operations, Ray Downey, an unbelievable guy, uh, U.S. Marine, fought in Korea. Um, he was the guy that Giuliani said, let's work with the Marine Corps, this specialized unit, that if we need them, they know how to get in. They know how to get into the subways. They know our language. They know our incident command system. They understand that. So I spent a year working with a guy named Jack Fanning, who was a special op he was the uh, special operations chief, hazmat kind of guy, Ray Downing, who was the chief of special operations like in Guam, and we just trained and trained in all kinds of things throughout that city. And again, I had Marines who were 19, 20 years old who were repelling off major towers within New York City who were learning how to do all kinds of things from kicking in doors to going to subways to, you know, how to eat a good New York City deli uh, bagel. I mean, they taught us every aspect of getting a bit of good, and I'm a New York guy, but these guys are real <laughs> downstate New Yorkers. And, uh, and just, man, the brotherhood was just, uh, was, again, it was almost as if we found our brothers, but in the civilian sector, mm. in the FDNY mm. and the PD. And it's funny, because the FDNY and the PD, uh, those guys hate each other, you know, almost like the Marine Corps and the Army does, that rivalry mm -hmm. goes on. At the end of the day, they got each other's back, but there's just a heavy sense of rivalry. Um, so. I'm working in and out of the Middle East. I'm going over the embassies in Jordan and Kuwait. I'm coming back. I'm taking units up to New York. And then I, so I had this two front thing going on. And it was really a unique position that I was in. And I think there was only, there was only a couple of us, I think, in the entire Marine Corps who were doing that kind of stuff. So I was doing some Homeland stuff before Homeland Security was going on. And, and I was working heavy in the Middle East and uh, various countries in the East, checking to the embassy. We do some training with the locals. Uh, I spent time and time in Armand, Jordan, um, working with their Jordanian Ministry of Defense and understanding how were they protecting themselves against uh, acts of terrorism, what were their abilities, really looking to protect our own embassy. Um, you know, Doug, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's preventing the Benghazi from taking place. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's what goes down when the Benghazi goes down and you know, um, was there any legacy that maybe I or others could have put there that may have saw the writing on the wall with the State Department and those kind of things, but a lot of time doing that. So, mm -hmm. um, so I got my family, we got this great little place, and uh, we're now moved. They, they moved our entire unit um, into what's called Indian Head, Maryland, 19 miles south of Washington, D.C. They moved our whole entire unit. Um, and not to get too long-winded, but when I got to this unit in Second, uh, for, Fourth Marine Expeditionary Anti-Terrorism in the 2MEF, and there was rumors, and we had just moved there, and there was rumors that they were going to move our unit to Maryland. I'm thinking, okay, it's the Marine Corps. Yeah, they'll move, they'll move it when my kid joins the Corps, facetiously. We'll ne I'll never see that. You know, the Marine Corps doesn't do anything quickly. Lisa and I bought a house, a little Cape Cod house in Jacksonville, North Carolina. I think mm. we bought that in July. And uh, they moped their entire unit that March. Mm. So we were there for the summer, the winter, and gone in March. Put that thing up, and that's the life of the Corps. Put that thing up uh, for rent. Yeah. And now our, we moved up to Maryland. And uh, so now we're in Maryland. Lisa and I had moved, I think, 12 times. And now I'm at my probably a year, 18, 19, 20 at this point. Oh, yeah. We had moved 12 times, 12 different homes. It was situational normal for us, yeah. you know. And uh, so now we're up in Maryland going over to the Middle East, going up to, to, to New York, traveling all over the world, supporting this. And so our base was 19 miles south of Washington, D.C. My home was two miles from the base. And, uh, and it was an unbelievable uh, September morning. I mean, you just couldn't ask for a better. It reminded me a lot of upstate New York. The, the leaves were starting to turn. There was a crisp air. Uh, the white-tailed deer were starting to get in rut. Not to get too romanticized on you, but it was, it was one of those days. Mm -hmm. And I'm at work. We just got done PTing. We were up early in the morning. We PTed, um, and uh, and now we're getting ready to do our 9 a.m. command brief intel update. And uh, we're all we're all in the intel center, and we're all looking at the screen, and and our brains literally could not get through what we were seeing on the monitors uh, at 9 a.m. that morning. 
and and most of us were like this is this is just not this is not real this is not and we're looking at the phones we're looking at our intel going on and then nothing happening and we're watching this take place on the monitor in front of us um, and uh, and I'm looking at that in the World Trade Center and I'm thinking okay so our phones are gonna ring any moment now uh, we're gonna be out of here we're gonna be in the city and then all of a sudden the phone did ring and it said the next one's coming to DC and I'm thinking oh my gosh my kids I'm you know I'm just we're 19 miles south yeah. of DC and sure enough that next one uh, and I don't remember if I saw the second jet go in the tower or uh, the one was going towards DC and landed in Pennsylvania um, but the whole morning was was complete was complete shock and uh, it, and we're we're waiting and waiting, and, and that was that was that was probably one of the hardest things. And I remember we got together, we 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 called everybody back to the base, we locked down our base. We knew we were going to get a phone call in a moment. Everybody had um, maybe about 40 minutes to connect with their families, and then we were going to shut down all sort of communications. And um, and I reached out to Lisa and I said, just please don't let the kids watch TV. Just she saw it. And uh, and our kids were home for the day, and I said, just just don't let them, just don't sit there and watch this. Um, she had been around the core long enough to know that no news is good news. I will tell you either way. I won't hide anything from you. And um, and oh by the way, I left a few things at the house. Could you bring bring them down to me? And she goes, I'd love to. And uh, again, right out of the right out of the damn books, uh, she shows up with my three kids now. Josh is probably 13, Jesse's probably 11, Ryan's maybe 8, I think maybe even Ryan's a little younger, he's got to be younger than that. And he had that ready pack that I had next to my bed. I wasn't on our emergency alert roll, but after, nine, after that day, we knew everybody was going to be on the alert. So, man, I remember that kid, he, uh, I'm in the parking lot, um, this is all going on, everything had crashed, everything, we're just still waiting for our call. And my kid, who's eight, um, had that pack. It was your typical green uh, camouflage pack and Murphy on it, my rank on it. And he hands it to me, and he's just like, are you coming home tonight? And he's looking at me, and, and, and so nothing prepared me for that, mm -hmm. that day. Nothing prepared me. And, you know, I could deal with all this stuff all over the world, but nothing prepared me to look at an eight-year-old kid who knew something just happened in both New York and D.C., and asked me, are you coming home that day? And it was just like that frozen time. Mm -hmm. It was the uh, John F. Kennedy's kid saluting him when the uh, cascade goes by, when the Kennedy funeral goes by. It was that moment for me. And I, and I, and I don't think I, I answered that question well. I looked at him and said, I tried to, I, I couldn't lie, and I, I didn't want to come across as macho, tough guy. Mm -hmm. And I said, uh, son, mom will take care of you. We'll just take it one day at a time. Yeah. Um, and they had to get in the car and they left. Um, and then what, what, what was the hardest thing for us then is this whole waiting thing because the nation is now paralyzed. Our, uh, are we going to war? Are we not going to mm -hmm. war? Is there more? Where do we send this unit? We were a one-of-a-kind unit. Do we send yeah. them to New York? Do we send them to D.C.? Um, and I thought the, the waiting mm -hmm. was, was going to just drive me out of my mind. Um, mm -hmm. And it, at this point, I was mature enough not even to consider I want my time on combat. It was I had I'd moved on from that. Mm -hmm. The way I felt as a young guy in in, uh, in Kuwait, mm -hmm. I'd moved on from that. And I'm thinking, what are we going to do? So we had the whole unit, everybody bed down right there. Uh, we wake up the next day, and uh, and my phone is going going crazy. And I'm calling and I'm talking to people, and they're like, Murph, we lost Ray, we lost Jack, and they're naming the guys mm -hmm. I worked with in New York, and they're just gone. Mm -hmm. um, and I understood their incident command system. I understood how they responded. Um, I understood they had that warrior mentality. They were going to get right in the middle of the front. And for them, that means getting on the 30th floor of the World Trade mm -hmm. and setting up their command post and doing what they needed to do, never expecting that that thing would fall down on top mm -hmm. of them. And uh, that 24 hours for me, um, I lost uh, too many uh, good friends. Um, the day was uh, that beautiful autumn day, but that when that tragedy took place, that incident took place, it was it was just mm -hmm. even to this point, it's uh, it's next to impossible to even comprehend the paradox of of my my love for the outdoors, my love for the autumn, but then 
this this incident takes place that mm -hmm. I just lose just way too many people at the time. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, yeah. we're waiting for a phone call to say go fight. And we're all like ready to go fight. Yeah. Um, and this is already 16 years ago, right? And yeah. a lot of folks, especially kids today, it's sort of ancient history in yeah. some way. Yeah. But I mean, what for a lot of people that day was exceptional or those, those days and those weeks yeah that we knew that something had changed. Yeah. We just don't know what direction we're going to be heading. Mm -hmm. You know, for the, someone like you who's in yeah. the thick of that yeah. Yeah. attack, like whereas there might be a military action in, in mm -hmm. you know, the Pacific, yeah. Japan, station here, Lebanon, etc. Mm -hmm. here, now it's, it's, yeah. at, it's home, yeah. right? Yeah. And, uh, and then for your family and you, where are you going to be going yeah. this week, next where, week? Where, when, How, my what, parents, you know, my brothers, my sisters. Yeah. Because at that night, there was no communication. It was just cut off. Yeah. Yeah. So where do you sort of, you know, physically go from there? And uh, um, we, <clears throat> we were locked down for, I think it was up to four to five days with no communication. Uh, uh, I think my, my wife at that time thought we had already pushed out to some place that, you know, she didn't know. We wouldn't know either. We were all hoping to either get into New York or get down to the Pentagon, um, you know, to get someplace. And, uh, and start doing something, um, whether it was set up sites, start gathering intel, whatever we needed to do. And, uh, and that call never came. Mm -hmm. I mean, we sat and we sat and we trained and we contemplated. And we, we rolled scenarios, we pulled intel, we were doing all kinds of stuff. Um, and that, that call never came. What was really interesting for me during that time, because I had already um, worked so much in the Middle East, um, there was a lot of embassies in the Middle East looking for what we call a joint tactical augmentation cell, a JTAC, which is just five of us, um, to get over into the Middle East pretty quick. Um, and for me, um, there was probably a bit of selfishness of saying, I need to get some payback somehow, I need to do something. That was going on. Um, but they, they let us go home on day five. And now I'm going home at day five and my kids are looking at me and I'm looking at them. and. You know, uh, I think the the emotional the, the stress that just went on from just all that waiting. Um, I think we tried to make things normal mm -hmm. until September 16th. Uh, I don't know how good you are in your history, or September 18th maybe. Um, that's when the uh, anthrax letter got mailed to the Capitol mm -hmm. um, out of Fort Detrick, and that's where then they called me and they called us, uh, quite a few of us from our unit and said we need you to get down into D.C we're not sure what to do with this. And you've got this anthrax letter that came in to the Dirksen building mm -hmm. that basically said, um, had a very overt um, um, Islamic, pro-Islamic type of language, um, Allah Akbar, at the end of it, death to America, death mm -hmm. to Israel kind of stuff. And so, there wasn't much we could do, more forensic stuff working with the FBI, but now from September 16th to right around the 1st of August or October, now we're helping to manage uh, this continuity of government. Government operations essentially had to shut down because you've got contaminated anthrax throughout the House and mm -hmm. the Senate, and how are you managing all this? Now, I wasn't a... A CBR kind of guy. I was. Uh, I was a. I was an operator in the sense of being able to organize. Um, you know, chaotic. You know, incidences and bring some normalcy to some chaos. Mm -hmm. um, so I became an operations officer very quickly. The Coast Guard was in because they do great incident command kind of stuff. It was well over the heads mm -hmm. of anything the Capitol Police or our nation responders, which are unbelievable people. Alexandria Fire Department and these kind of people who were mm -hmm. doing their best hazmat kind of stuff. But this was weapons grade DOD um, anthrax, and uh, and this stuff was all over the place that mm. was being spread. So now, instead of being home, I'm camping out on Washington D.C. Um, with a couple thousand Marines, mm. and not only are we trying to do security kind of stuff, but now we're also very heavily involved with um, finding um, this anthrax. Uh, figuring out the extent of this anthrax, getting just like you would um, an, an investigative type of where's the strain, where was it produced, you can look at it, you can look at the strands of the anthrax and say was that U.S. made, was that mm -hmm. you know something that was made uh, overseas, looking at all those kind of things. Okay. And um, again, beautiful autumn, but then that other phone call came in and says we need Murphy and a team over to uh, Kuwait 
pretty quick. And then I landed in Kuwait on the October 30th, 2001, preparing to go to Afghanistan or Iraq, depending on what the, uh, now I'm part of this first Marine Division um, unit that was there to do force protection of all of Middle Eastern, all U.S. forces in the entire Middle Eastern region preparing for mm -hmm. the next attack. And I wound up in the desert um, in that, that October of 2001. Okay. And how long were you there? The entire winter. Uh, okay. I worked the entire winter. Uh, um, really interesting uh, organization. It was a coalition. It was, uh, it was the Czech Republics. It was the French. It was the Aussies. It was the Brits. I think the entire world was looking for um, who are the bad guys and how do we close with and destroy the bad guys. Um, there was a lot of that, you know, carry the, uh, the FDNY uh, shield inside my helmet. There was a lot of that we will pay back kind of vindictive uh, mantra that was going on. But you couldn't find the enemy. And, uh, and so we're sitting in Kuwait. You know, trying to figure out if we invade Iraq, what do those Iraqi war plans, uh, war plans look like? But most importantly, we're looking in the mountains of Afghanistan and what's, what's, what's next there. Mm -hmm. And that's where my forte was, because uh, I'd already been in the Middle East for so long prior to that, from 99 to 2000, 2001, pre-October, pre-September there. Uh, knew the embassy officials, knew from the Jordanian side to the Kuwaiti side, the Bahrain side. Uh, if you name the Middle Eastern country, mm -hmm. I had been there, I had worked it, knew people there, and my whole sole job was to, um, to, uh, to hook up with those host nation type of uh, people mm -hmm. and start figuring out where do we need to be. And I think that, um, I think that December, I think it was just before Christmas, is when um, the first Marines saw combat action in the mountains of Afghanistan. And I had gotten to a position where I was not in the, the, uh, the, the front of the engagement. I was in working with the leaders of, uh, of tribes, with collecting information, talking. Uh, I, was, I was pretty safe, but I remember, uh, you know, when I mean safe, I'm meaning, you know, here's three miles and here's I am and, and here's a Marine unit only three miles away. You hear everything that's going on. And I remember talking to a young Marine who just came back, you know, if you want to call it the front, but you know, there's no yeah. front like in World War II, there's nothing like that. Uh, we needed to see what was in the cave, we needed to go into the cave, we needed to see what was the intel, what could the, what could the Taliban, what, you know, what could the Al-Qaeda, whoever we were trying to get our hands around, what were the capabilities, and mm -hmm. we blow the hell out of these caves, we just crush these things and then go in and, and look at them and, and figure out their capabilities uh, at the whole time that the U.S. is just throwing all kinds of stuff at us, the war effort you know, robotics to, you know, maybe you could use this robot to do this and maybe do that. And, mm -hmm. you know, we're just trying to figure things out. I, hell, I, I lived on a Bic razor and a, and a bottle of water just to kind of keep clean for the first, that whole winter. Mm -hmm. But back to that young Marine, I remember looking at him and there, I remember, you know, again, growing up in my generation, reading some of the World War II comics. And I remember running into a Marine and this kid hadn't shaved in like three or four days and he was wore out. I mean, just been in the mountains for days, dehydrated, chap lips. And I'm looking at this guy, and I'm, first of all, I'm thinking, how did he get up there? How did he get there before I did? You know, and where mm -hmm. did this Marine unit come from? I'm mm -hmm. trying to get my hand around all this. I'm trying to pull in the Czechs and the French and the Aussies, and we're trying to pull this whole coalition together, but we're doing combat operations at the same time. Yeah. We're flying in all out of the Middle East, and, and this whole winter was just, it was complete chaos. Mm -hmm. It was just literally complete. We're, we're, we're blowing stuff up. We're, 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 uh, you know, thankfully, nobody's getting hurt on our side. I, I think we're trying to make ourselves stuff, self feel better, um, but uh, it was it was the it was what we learned from Clausewitz and others. It was the fog of war. Mm -hmm. It was a complete it was a complete mess. It was it was hard to find God, core, and country, and all that. It was hard to find some sanity. I was mm -hmm. older. I didn't want to get into a. a um, we need revenge, we need payback. I'm trying to use more of my mind analytically to try mm -hmm. to figure out, you know, how do we attack this problem? We had an unbelievable uh, two-star general who was an infantry officer who was in charge of this whole unit. He brought a lot of stability to this. Mm -hmm. We had more money, more resource, resources that he can imagine. The entire weight of the United States was behind this effort. Mm -hmm. And that first winter, I found myself just uh, in places that, uh, 
uh, on top of mountains, inside caves, to, to just throw in all kinds of uh, artillery at anything that even looked like a remote bad guy mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, and uh, took very seriously the rank that I had on my collar. Um, and then the young Marines who, that maybe I would say, we need to find out what's over there, go find out what's over there, remembering my days when I was at 21 year old, mm -hmm. I'll do anything for you, just tell me where to go, kind of guy. And now you're a warrant officer, mm -hmm. you're, what I'm is your? I'm a W-4, I'm the senior officer in the Marine Corps, and a senior officer in the Marine Corps, I'm a, I, I've reached that designation of what's called a subject matter expert mm -hmm. um, in response to terrorism, to disaster control, disaster mm -hmm. planning, um, international relationships. Has your, um, you know, because we're still in Afghanistan 15, 16 years later, um, did get a few of the bad guys mm -hmm. over there mm -hmm. or maybe across the border in mm -hmm. Pakistan. But in those days, those weeks after 9-11 where it was hard not to have some strong emotional feelings about certain mm -hmm. things and what you're doing. Um, uh, what do you think about uh, the fact that we're still in Afghanistan so so much like 15, 16 years later? Is it what does that does that tell you anything? Has your attitude towards mm -hmm. the whole 9/11 mm -hmm. post 9/11 situation changed at all? Or one of the things that I say often when I speak is uh, our nation has done an unbelievable job of. Um, of really um, separating their ideas uh, from the political position to supporting the warfighter. Um, this nation uh, supports the warfighter today. Uh, I can't imagine. I can't imagine how it could be any better from the uh, the civilians who just who just long to do anything they can to support the warfighter, uh, but at the same time have a unbelievable strong opinion against the war in itself, uh, the political approach to it. Uh, the economic approach to it, the cause of the approach, uh, and and I think as a nation we do a really good job of trying to figure this out. Um, we can only learn, guys, from you and I from history books of Vietnam uh, when we started getting into this counterinsurgency, insurgency kind of stuff, and you have no idea who the enemy is. It's mm -hmm. never going to be as clean as it was, and and he, can you ever say that World War II and mm -hmm. you know even Korea started getting cloudy with the Koreans and the Chinese, but those fronts are gone. And, uh, and so when I look back at uh, my son who joined the Marine Corps and wound up in the exact same locations that I was at when mm. I was over in the Middle East, and uh, you can't help but think it through as a father and as a, um, and as a man now who studies uh, the whole idea of the military operations and veterans and reintegrating back in the community that some things just don't make sense, and, uh, and I, I don't see how we get out of Afghanistan clean, and, and the reason being is because the minute that one politician, uh, and I'll be pretty candid about this, the minute that one politician states that um, um, there's no victory in this, by default you have to then say that uh, my deployment, my kid's uh, deployment, and the men and women who didn't come home and the ones who are now are scarred from that, did they actually have any, any meaning? Did they mm. bring any kind of um, civility to, to people in Afghanistan or Iraq? Now, from my personal experience, I know that uh, in the tribes or the small areas that we worked with, that for a moment of time, we individuals, human beings came together made a difference for those people for that moment of time. Mm -hmm. The minute we left, I have no idea what took mm -hmm. place after that. Um, being able to smoke a hookah and, and drink a tur uh, Turkish coffee and have conversations about who are the good guys, who are the bad guys, what does an Afghanistan look, what does a free and independent Afghanistan look like, mm -hmm. uh, what does an Afghanistan that's uh, out from the, uh, the farming of the poppy seed look like, what does a new crop look like. Mm -hmm. uh, we had those conversations, but from a, a geopolitical mm -hmm. kind of standpoint, um, whenever a politician uses the words, boots on the ground, I look right at them, the Lindsey Grahams and the Donald Trumps and the rest, and I say, do you know what it cost mm -hmm. to put those boots on the ground? It's easy all day long to count bullets and band-aids. I can count those. I mean, that's undergraduate Excel work. Mm -hmm. um, but those men and women, I don't think, mm -hmm. really have a handle on counting the cost from the long-term effects mm -hmm. on a nation uh, to what it takes to reintegrate a military member back into mm -hmm. the civilian population. We have great um, educational benefits for the men and women who served. Uh, f uh, we have 
decent health care. I was on the t today with a, a representative from the VA, and I'm just um, and again the VA like any organization has unbelievable people and has has people that you wonder why they're in their job. Mm -hmm. And I and I personally have a hard time when I run across those people in the VA who you wonder why are you in the job you have the, the most mm -hmm. bureaucratic, offensive, rude individual that you can meet. And I'm just mm -hmm. trying to help out another vet who now this vet happens to be a hundred percent permanent and total disabled, mm -hmm. try to work through an education benefit, and I'm dealing with someone who could frankly give a damn about that veteran, and they represent the VA. Mm -hmm. So when that congressman or that senator or that politician says the boots on the ground, oh, I challenge them to give me a cost, and what is it, how do you really quantify yeah. um, the cost of doing that? Yeah. So your question about how do I think about that with my son being over there, and thank God that he's home, but he got home and he's got a disability. Mm -hmm. And he's he's reintegrating like I'm reintegrating, um, and I know I'm an older guy now. Um, I have some serious, um, some very serious uh, thoughts on mm -hmm. our continued efforts in the Middle East um, and future, you yeah. know, future endeavors that may take place. Well, the military can do a whole heck of a lot, but in certain situations, it can't do everything. It's not. I think yeah. some of our former generals, unfortunately, that were trying to tear down monuments to them as well. I think they had that ideal. I mean, the Lees and the Jacksons, and just like the Lincolns did, and the, even the Martin Luther did from the uh, Civil Rights Movement, there was a time and a place, and there's a things that the military can do as a show of force. Mm -hmm. But unless you have a political, unless you have a, um, like the Kennedy, uh, the Kennedy administration, when he brought in the, the Peace Corps and these type of things, unless you have something to back all those things up, it is not, um, the military is just a, yeah. it, it's not the answer. Yeah, and sometimes I wonder, is World War II really the paradigm we should be mm -hmm. sort of using as our benchmark, or mm -hmm. is it going to be now at Vietnam, Afghanistan, counterinsurgency, mm -hmm. political, mm -hmm. cultural stuff that yeah. the yeah. military is one asset, but yeah. not the only one. So. And the military made, uh, made grave errors in, the, in, in, in Afghanistan, going over there and making assumptions uh, Let's just give this tribe all this stuff. You know, some some highly educated marine uh, military officer would say, maybe if we just bring him all these things and we give him all this stuff, and then all of a sudden, you know, I'm on the ground with the tribesmen and they're looking at me like, don't you dare give me something. You know, I'm not taking your American charity. Yeah. If you want to come work alongside me, if you want to work with me, you know, that that whole understanding mm -hmm. of you know what makes an Afghan tribesman click versus what makes a blue collar. Um, you know, auto industry, U.S. worker click. Yeah. Unless we figure these things out from the humanistic an and standpoint, yeah. the U.S. can do unbelievably great things, yeah. but boy, we can we can make some dumb ish uh, decisions at the same time. So now chronologically, we're getting pretty close to the end of your military service. Mm -hmm. Did we miss anything in the last few years? No, that, uh, that coming home was, uh, that coming home in that spring was, uh, was pretty special um, uh, for that first deployment over there, that coming back. It, another paradigm that, uh, that I don't think that, that it's not probably written in, in books anywhere. It's, you, you, you literally leave the desert, You've, you wind up on a flight line someplace, say in, uh, in Kuwait, you jump on a civilian plane, you land in BWI, you know, 12 hours later, you might get lucky to get a layover in Shannon, Ireland, where you can get a, a Guinness for two hours, but then you're literally back in the States within the time the sun went up to the sun went down. Mm -hmm. And there is no, at that point, there is no reintegration, there is no winding down. For me personally, I, I left that winter or that spring of 2002, got back to the States. Lisa picked me up with the kids. We're back in this Southern Maryland little house. My son now, the one who was eight I was telling you about, has probably got a dozen chickens. He built a chicken coop. He's <laughs> trying to, you know, do chicken and laying eggs and everything. And I'm out there trying to mend a fence and, and there's a horse and a dog. And I am, uh, Doug, I am just, I'm out of my mind. My senses are in overdrive because now in Southern Maryland in the spring, the daffodils, the grass, everything's green, the, 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 the honeybees, the pollen, it's on overdrive. And I just literally just the day before walked out of the, the dirt mm -hmm. uh, and the dust coming off of winter, burnt up in my face, chapped up lips, uh, cracked ears kind of thing. And, um, and I'm just looking around at my kids and I'm looking around and my wife knew that I was just kind of a little bit spooked out about this whole thing. But again, 
you do what a marine's supposed to do, and you just kind of suck it up and you move on. I learned that from my dad. Mm -hmm. You don't you don't bring anything up. You don't do anything. Funny story is I'm helping my son with this chicken coop, and I I laid a hammer onto my thumb, uh, pounding, and the whole thing blew up, uh, bleeding. The whole thing went black, and now for the next three months, if you ever get a uh, a blood blister underneath here. Everybody's asking me that I get hurt in Afghanistan, <laughs> and it happened 24 hours. I didn't get a scratch over there. It happened 24 hours after I got home. Okay. And I'm walking around with this thumb of mine. It's just, yeah. And how's the the f bombs and the s bombs at that point? Uh, yeah, it's um, it, they're they're all over the place. They're <laughs> they're all over the place. Um, had to really think through um, because my wife and I really made a, a conscious decision trying to not. Not not um, not overprotect our kids, but be on the offense of how do you integrate all this stuff. Uh, knowing now my son is probably 15, and uh, and yeah, so this is wrapping up my career. A couple more times, two two more times over there, similar to those those same kind of things that we've already talked about. To finally we wrap up, and, and it was really interesting because now it's in October of 2004, I think, where it's time for me to. Um, the Marine Corps wants to do a great job by me and send me to a, a desk job in headquarters Marine Corps. Um, I'm up for promotion, CW05, uh, at 23, 24 years in and out this time, and I said I, I can't see myself going out. I've been operational since I, the day I joined the Marine Corps, and I can't see myself doing policy procedure. I might have been good at it, but um, but yeah, I thought it was a good time. My, my mind was literally... Um, racing with this unbelievable love of the core, this unbelievable, the core knows what it's doing, the core creates leaders, it creates war warriors, um, but I was at that point where my thinking on the political use of military force um, was starting to change, and I mm -hmm. knew that I did not want to be one of those purse people in front of Marines to even, and they'll pick it up in a heartbeat, to even even through my body language, mm -hmm. have a sense of doubt in our purpose. So I came to the point where um, I had an unbelievable uh, run at the core. I was still young. I think I made a difference. I think I saved people's lives. I think I made a difference internationally, mm -hmm. both in Asia and over in the Far East. And and um, and I thought it was a good time to, to then move on. Okay. And at that point in 2003, 2004, we're, we're looking at increasing sort of deployments and recurrent deployments mm -hmm. and that could have been your life for the next 10 years. That could have been, absolutely. You know, and, absolutely. and you got kids and mm -hmm. everything like that and mm -hmm. um, that's, uh, uh, so you decided to retire and did you have any ideas about what you wanted to do after that? Well, I did. I, um, I did, uh, I wanted to go up to the Adirondack Mountains and <laughs> My uh, my transition was going to be this. Uh, maybe I maybe I read uh, um, uh, what's it Walden's Pond, the book. Mm -hmm. Maybe I read that a couple too many times. And I said, let me go out in the mountains for a month, mm -hmm. and let me just kind of soul search. So I uh, contacted my brother. I said, hey, uh, let's meet up in November, um, and let's let's spend a month in the woods in the Adirondacks. Mm -hmm. And somehow I thought that doing that and coming back out before Christmas, that I would process things pretty well. I had a great job that uh, my time on Capitol Hill when I worked that anthrax incident and, and worked with them, some other uh, organizations, they knew that they needed people like me to help the Capitol Police. I wasn't a Capitol Police officer. I was a House and Senate uh, high-ranking official. I was a director of their Weapons of Mass Destruction Special Operations Response Unit to do the exact same thing I did in the military to do on Capitol okay. Hill to pick up where the Secret Service left off. My job as the Speaker of the House, Dennis Haster, was the time, moved mm -hmm. into uh, uh, Nancy Pelosi when she took in, when the Democrats became the majority. And so that was my gig starting in December. So I said, let me just decompress for the month of November. Mm -hmm. My family was all on board with it, came back out of the woods, had a nice little beard and everything else, and then I shaved that all off and put on the suit and tie and wound up down on Capitol Hill. Mm -hmm. And that was going to be my gig for the rest of my life. And then that lasted about four years, and I realized that um, again, I, I hope you hear everything I'm saying. We have the, the best, I think, the best political system, our constitutional, democratic way of thinking than of every country I've ever been into, um, that, that anybody else. Uh, but you just have to be, have the right 
stomach to be that close to politics to mm. be able to work through that. And in about two years, I realized that um, um, civilians really don't have a sense of, they do, but not the sense that I've experienced of this thing called camaraderie. Mm -hmm. When someone says, I've got your back, what does that really mean when they say that? Mm -hmm. The sense of loyalty. Um, I realized that within the first 30 days of working there that that was completely absent from my life. That I, even I was working with law enforcement and these type of people, yeah. um, it was a very foreign group of people in regards to um, if you made one wrong misstep, I, I'm, I, there was no future for me. Mm -hmm. At least in the core, I could I could fall down and someone would pick me back up, dust me back off, and say you're an idiot, and then get back into it. Though, yeah. on the hill, it was it was completely different from that. Okay. So I lasted about three or four years and did an unbelievable job. Helped the uh, Obama administration get in, did the same kind of things. I, I worked the entire Ricin incident. Okay. When the Ricin came in, my team, my job, the whole thing, presidential State of the Union addresses all kinds of suspicious package from radiological dirty bombs, all that kind of stuff. But I just saw the writing on the wall that um, uh, I thought now that my time is over on the core, that um, my time with working with other civilians in that close proximity, that it will never ever be the way it was. And mm -hmm. I had to get out of there very okay. quickly. It okay. just, I wasn't transitioning very well at all. So you had almost the same kind of responsibility as when you yeah. were in the Marines, but yeah. without the the brotherhood of the Marines Absolutely. in some way, which yeah. that's going to make it yeah. difficult. So. Unbelievable, sexy job, a great Crown Vic, uh, respond on 24 hours. I had this badge that I literally could go anywhere in the Capitol. Mm. Uh, on the 4th of July, uh, Senator McCain came up and said, Murph, are we looking safe today? I mean, that kind of relationship that I had. I had my brothers. Uh, Christmas, I take him to the White House or take him into the Capitol. You know, um, you know, take him a tour on the Capitol with the Christmas tree lighting. It was a lot of. It was what we call in my world. It was a sexy job, very mm -hmm. prestigious, a lot of money. Um, you know, and then on the Capitol Fourth, when you're sitting up on the bel on the on the on the uh, balcony, and you're looking out at you know the Dolly Partons and everybody else playing, and John McCain walks up to you and says, "We good? Yes, sir. We're good." I mean, you can't beat that mm -hmm. kind of. It gets into here like you are someone, um, but down in here, um, I, I would I would throw up often uh -huh. just going home, just with the stress of knowing that the team I had, I don't think anybody's got their back except me. I'm asking them to do the same things we did in the military, mm -hmm. um, and it was just a very for me it was just um, it was different. Yeah, and some people do very well at that, and for me it wasn't where I needed to be. Yeah, I actually uh, I think I. I think I disrespected Nancy Pelosi, um, <laughs> and I verbally said some things to her that I, uh, someone pulled me aside afterwards and said I did. I, the Marine came out of me. We were doing a, uh, a State of the Union address, and she was in presidential succession, and she was underneath my charge to keep her alive had something happened. And so I was very firm in regards to how this procedure needed to go down, and she had a red power suit on and mm. heels, and uh, she looked at me and said, young man, this is not my first rodeo. And I said, ma'am, this is not mine either, and I'm responsible. Mm -hmm. And uh, she didn't say anything, um, and I never got in trouble for it, but I just realized that's probably not how you speak to the Speaker of the House. Yeah. And I felt that, uh, and this has got nothing to do with Republican, Democrat. It's got to, it could have been anybody. It could have been Boehner. It could have been anybody in that mm -hmm. position. I would, I would take my job very seriously. But then, then I got thinking that... Uh, why would they understand the height of the level in which I come from? Why would they, even though they were through, the Capitol was supposed to get hit on 9-11, and it didn't, the Pentagon mm -hmm. didn't. So they, 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 they experienced the fear, but I just happened to be groomed for this for the last 20-some-odd years. So I thought it was unfair of the way I think I treated her at that time, but I knew that uh, I probably wouldn't have had a career had I stayed there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then before we get to uh, South Carolina and, and USC Aiken, I just wanted to curious. I want to go back to the cabin mm -hmm. in the woods up in the Adirondacks. <laughs> yeah. Did that work? It, you know, I thought it did. So my brother, um, I, I got a family who, uh, this one brother of mine, Brian, is uh, probably my biggest cheerleader the entire time I was in the Corps. I mean, this guy would contact me, write letters back and forth. and. You know, I think he was the guy, he was the Boy Scout, he was the guy who rose up. I don't know if he became an Eagle Scout or not, but 
he wanted to follow my father's footsteps, but at that time, um, so he was probably in high school in the 70s, Vietnam protesting going on. Uh, my father was like, I think he asked my father, very private between him and my father, and I think my father said no. The Corps was just filled with drugs and very, you know, it was, it was kind of a kind of a Wild West kind of thing. And mm -hmm. he didn't do it. He went to college. Um, and uh, and so when I did, so when I'm coming back three years after him, just three years, you know, things had changed a little bit. So I'm in the Corps. And so um, he would just, he just want to know everything about the Marine Corps. He wanted to know about boot camp and everything else. So when he was the guy who said, Rob, I'll be there with you. So when I pulled up in my pickup truck, and, the, and this is, you know, this is old school upstate New York in the Adirondack Mountains, uh, forever wild land. Mm -hmm. um, only a handful of people know some of these trails that you get into on these things. And I ran, and I knew exactly where we were going to meet and pull off. Uh, it's a gorgeous uh, November day, just ice cold out there. It was, I think it was maybe drizzling, the snow was going to come the next day. And he's there with a case of Jenny Cream Ale, this, uh, this Genesee beer that's made in upstate New York. And mm -hmm. he, that was the beer that we used to sneak when we were 13, 14 years old. And he was there with that case of beer. And we actually drank a beer and went on a night hunt that night. Wow. And so I got there maybe at 3 o'clock, sun goes down at 530. And yeah, we, uh, we spent a lot of time in that cabin. We'd get up in the morning, the snow come, and it was just, is that ideal of this is where my real roots were, mm -hmm. in, that, in that mound, in that cabin, in those areas. Things were very familiar, the same trails we walked on, following in my father's footsteps uh, in, you know, when we were hunting with him. He would walk, and because the snow was so deep, we tried to put our foot into his footprints. And so the whole mountain range, Wolf mm -hmm. Pond mountain range, was hauntingly familiar in regards to this, to me, was extremely normal. Mm -hmm. um, and what I did think it benefited is because um, because of 9-11, because of the other incidents, because of my life of, you just never knew what the next moment was going to bring. Um, um, and it's pitch black up there in the Adirondacks. I didn't have one bit of, I didn't have a single nightmare, I didn't have a single dream, I never, I never even, because when we grew up there was no phones, no mm -hmm. electricity, no nothing. It was the time the Murphys went and we literally, there wasn't a grid back then, but we were off the grid, yeah. if you know what I mean. And so when I got up there and uh, in 2004, that winter of 2004, um, it was probably one of the most peaceful things that I've done ever okay. since I got out of the military. So even after, you know, the, the lantern, the campfire goes out at night and things... Mm -hmm. It's just you and your thoughts and your you brain. And your thoughts. that was all right. It was perfectly okay because there, uh, because at that point up there, I just knew that there was um, any of the bad guys I was looking for in the Middle East probably wouldn't be able to handle a night in the mountains where I was up there. Mm. Um, and then the rednecks that we have in upstate New York, <laughs> uh, you know, those guys are a, a good bunch of people as well. But no, it was, it was surprising. I, I, I only have that, uh, that, that sense of serenity and that sense of peace when I'm up there. Mm -hmm. um, and I try to get up there every year. I don't have it here. I don't have it at home. Um, I, I deal with things now being back home. Uh, in this kind of always on the alert, uh, always where I sit, always where I think. Um, I'm always having to be on front, what I say, when I say it, how I say it. Um, and uh, only my wife knows what happens in the middle of the night kind of things. But up there, for some reason, um, it's the only place I can find peace. Okay. Yeah, it's a pretty special place. So you leave um, the Capitol and, and uh, your job there with the police. And is that the point where you come back to school when you go back to uh, yeah, college? Yeah, it is, it is. I, um, I, um, that's when I realized all that, all that went on and I said, uh, I've got to figure out this civilian thing pretty quick. And, um, and I've just got to go and become a civilian. And so uh, my wife and I started looking at towns. Uh, her mother had moved down to Aiken. She was a Connecticut person in the school, you know, in the high school guidance counselor kind of stuff. We came and visited her. And we saw this little tiny patriotic community, but a non-military base. I mean, Fort Gordon might be down the road, but I've been here for five, six years now, and I've been to Fort Gordon maybe three times, mm -hmm. and Fort Jackson on the other side. But it's a non-military town, but it's a very patriotic town. It's one of those towns where you got some military retirees in the town, but no one's really expecting uh, crime is low. There's not all kinds of things going on for the most part, comparatively speaking. And I literally thought um, I could come in uh, be a nobody. I was really looking forward to being an absolute nobody. Uh, go to school. See, this is that transition even in higher ed where 
Remember I told you with the basic course in TBS or the basic course TBS when I really said, man, this school stuff could be neat. So I went from my 30s to my 40s just longing to get into some advanced education. Mm -hmm. I actually would read philosophy books, history books. When I'm over in the Middle East, I would have great theological conversations with good Muslim men who were in the Jordanian army. Uh, I would talk theology, he talked theology, and we would compare pro and con from the Muslim faith, the Quran to the, the you know, to the uh, Christian faith uh, with the Bible. And I just naturally just started picking up everything I could read. Mm. And so I wanted to say, I wanted to come and find some place I could just dive into and just do nothing mm. but go to school. And that's how I landed here at this university. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, you were a business administration Didn't I got, uh, got my degree in business administration. Okay. I had I'd wrestled with an idea of maybe doing a high school um, education, maybe being the, the soccer coach kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but I realized very quickly that uh, even in that sense, uh, probably my idea, what I grew up with with great coaches and that mentored me, probably wasn't the norm in today's high school coaching kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Just a different time period. And yeah. again, like I left the core, I didn't want to belittle the core because of my thinking. It's the same way. I didn't think it would be a good fit for me. Yeah. So business was pretty smart for me. Well, you got to get a permission slip before you can make a kid do a push-up yeah, these I days, Yeah, I think I would have so. to do that or, or yeah, <laughs> so. or raise my voice and say, you know, get up and get back to work kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. okay. So and It's not bad or right or wrong. It's just it's a different approach, that one that yeah. I might not be able to pick up. Yeah. Um, so how did you get to uh, become the working at USC Aiken as the director of the Veterans Success Center? Um, I, I think I think deep down, as much as I convinced myself that I wanted nothing to do with the, the military and I thought that was that was gone, that was a part of me, I, I think I was following right back into my father's footsteps. You know, you get into the civilian community, you just keep your mouth shut. Um, you know, my father was never a part of the Legion or the VA or any mm -hmm. of those kind of things, the VFW, he never did any of those things. And, and I really thought those things were for the World War II Korea, you know, guys, even Korea, but my dad didn't do that. And I just didn't see myself going to some VFW um, and drinking a beer and talking about the war stories. I didn't even think they could, uh, they could relate. Um, so this is 2000 and, uh, 2007, 8, 9 down here. And so um, as much as I convinced myself that, um, that uh, I was not going to, I lost it. That was a time in my past and I would never have that camaraderie that I joined the Marine Corps. Um, I started connecting with some other post 9-11 veterans who were on campus who were students as well and we started connecting and we started um, talking to people about maybe a student veterans organization but again we didn't want to do toga parties we thought organizations were frats we didn't know what we were talking about mm. I didn't know there was a difference between an organization and a frat I thought they were all the same and so we just started enjoying the camaraderie of one another you know mm. uh, uh, that professor is kind of funny this just you know what what really got us thinking was we and other combat veterans were stressing over the English department test, over the, the science department test, and we laughed at each other like, why are we stressing over this? This mm -hmm. is really a, such a non-issue. We, we, we laughed about it because our bodies could still feel stress mm -hmm. that's really ridiculous stress mm -hmm. compared to the stress we had been on before. Mm. And we laughed at each other. We'd go out and get a beer out in the town and, and talk about that. And, and just very naturally, we started figuring out how do we become civilians without, without being paramilitary, yeah. but yet just be civilians who deal with normal issues as well, yeah. which then led into uh, uh, Chancellor Jordan wanting to uh, really uh, do something different for the military members at this university, her carving out some space on campus and a little bit of money and saying, you know, Rob, I know you don't have all the answers, but what she did was basically take three months, look under the hood of this university, look at every one thing we do here from admissions to records to you name it, financial aid. We do well for military members, and what don't we do well? And I remember telling her that, uh, that um, I would do that, but I don't want to be associated with the VA. I don't want to be called the VA. I don't want to be the Veterans Affairs Campus VA kind of stuff. VA's already got that title. I don't mm -hmm. want that. Um, and I saw it as an opportunity. I didn't know where it would go because it was a temporary offer kind of thing. I saw it as an opportunity that maybe I could now use all this leadership and wisdom and things that I was figuring out that I could use it to help these now 20-something-year-old vets who were getting out after mm -hmm. one tour in the mil military and help them to, to transition. So that's what I did. I, I turned back to her a strategic plan that I learned from the school of business and what I picked up from the military. Yeah. And I said, if we want to do it, this is what we needed to be able to do it. 
everything from the chain of command to who I fall underneath in my position now, to funding, to the terminology, what we use, and then who's a part of that whole group, which is not only those veterans, but it's those spouses. It, it's my family. Yeah. It's my wife. It's my kids. And figuratively speaking, they're not on this campus, but it is my wife. We're still mm -hmm. together. I'm, you know, you know, wonderfully speaking, after so many years in the military, but it's it's military spouses. It's the military family members. It's the active mm -hmm. reservists and the veterans. And we make sure that we really work hard of ensuring that we reach out to the entire. The, the DoD is one of the the greatest diverse organizations out there. We make mm -hmm. sure that every single military affiliated member and understands they're a part of this yeah. this group on this campus. Yeah. And on our campus the the number of folks who have either, you know, military service mm -hmm. or a f member of the family yeah. is growing and growing. We're at hundred, several hundred people oh, almost so, right Yeah, now. we're about eleven point six percent of the entire student okay. population. Yeah. Sometimes I wish when I was a college student, since I'm a military brat, yeah. that I had a way to kind of find out that you know, other people who I might have oh, had yeah. some like in that yeah. in common with. Uh, yeah, and I think there's a great sense of camaraderie amongst those military family members as well. They mm -hmm. get in here, and even though their parents were, but they get it because some of these military family members were like my kids, went to high school in Japan, went to high school in Germany, went mm -hmm. to high school in Europe, you know, yeah. and or Texas, and they connect that way. And the veterans population in the center adds so much to our campus, our, our educational, our cultural mm -hmm. kind of climate in some way. Uh, all the students that I've had who are veterans, yeah. as far as I know, they, I mean, they've been excellent students. And it's just that maturity. It's yeah. that um, yeah. experience in some way. Um, and so I'm really glad that we have you when you have the mm -hmm. Veterans Center here mm -hmm. on campus. Um, where do you see the Veterans Center going in the next five or ten years? What what would you like to do? Would mm. you pretty much keep doing what you're doing? Is there mm. anything that you would want to do differently? Well, in, in the short term, uh, we're being asked often now to help out other universities do the same thing we're doing. I think we found a, uh, a niche, a business term, a special market that we mm -hmm. do to and it's all about success. That's why we call ourselves the Office of Veteran Military Student Success. We're not VA, we're success. We're all driven um, and if you look, listen to my whole story in the Marine Corps, it's all about um, being successful, positioning mm -hmm. yourself to be successful. Our whole vision is to best position veteran and military students uh, to achieve their educational career and life goals. So we mm -hmm. just position them, but I know what their capabilities are. So we get things out of the way, we position them, and we let them run. Other universities are trying to mirror our model. Um, they don't have the right people. A lot of it takes the people, just like the military, those 22-year-old people in the Philippines helping me get a jet off the and find a pilot kind of stuff. Um, it takes those right kind of people to be able to do that. So we've, uh, we're have we documenting everything we do. We're doing a lot of uh, data analysis and really formulating from a quantitative perspective what things are we doing that's making a difference in retention and graduation rates. And it's also mm -hmm. enrollment rates are off the charts. I think we brought in 122 students alone just this fall. Mm -hmm. um, so we're well over that, you know, 11%. To put that in perspective, most universities have between 4 to 6% on their campus. And mm -hmm. we're not a military town. We're not recruiting, you know, yeah. off the base to come here kind of thing. So to answer your question, I think we have a model that is really has a success-orientated drive to it. We're studying that from an analytical standpoint. And now I, I think we might get the attention of are we doing things that maybe civilian um, students can then um, tap into to help higher education uh, retention and progression and graduation okay. rates. If you take a look at a, you know, an academic success center outside the military veteran stuff, can we model some of this stuff for a traditional academic success center mm -hmm. and, 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 and do the same? Can we scale it for a, for a university-wide type of thing? Okay. I'd love to see us move into, in five years from now, take what we've learned here um, and then scale it out that it can be replicated university-wide, okay. not just toward. You're always going to have a veteran military niche, but can we do the same thing university-wide? Okay. So we've been on quite a journey from uh, upstate New York mm. and uh, boot camp um, and then various sort of deployments mm. here and there around the world, um, including Washington, D.C., and then back to South Carolina mm -hmm. to finish your education, yeah. and now your your directorship of the Veterans mm -hmm. and Military Success uh, Center. Um, is there anything that you think we might have missed or anything you want to add Rob, before we start to wind things up? I think um, 
you know, it's, uh, yeah. you know, it's funny. I think the Marine Corps might have this uh, stigma. Um, this is where the term jarhead came from. In the 50s, the girls out in California who used to date Marines would call them jarheads. They'd be out there on the beaches, and they had that haircut, the high and tight, and they would just say, you know, um, you're, you're just a jar. They just take your head, the top of your head off. They f they fill it through that stuff, and they put the jar back on. So you're, mm -hmm. that's where the term jarhead came from. It's not as glorious as the term leatherneck that came out of you know the the fighting the pirates in the Barbados or or devil dog that came out of Bella Wood in World War II fighting against the Germans there when they would say the Marines fight like they're possessed dogs and the mm -hmm. Germans were so fearful of the Marines. Um, so you have this. Um, you have this ideal that maybe Marines are robotic, this idea of warriors, and I think um, I think that uh, that has changed so much in regards to they are un un unbelievable warriors, but they are so the average of people in regards to who is serving our Department of Defense today. I mean, I could go on statistically about how many have some college and high school degrees. I mean, uh, the DOD right now, 99.6% of all military members have a high school diploma. Mm -hmm. The days of going to jail or going to the military are gone. The days of the GED are so remote. The days of, you know, having a drug waiver and all these kind of things. I mean, you have your star athletes, your educational type of people. They're unbelievably formally academic and, and intelligent in mind. but. Um, I think as a nation, th these young men and women, because they're given leadership and guidance and then a direction, and then the bureaucracy's kind of taken away, it's amazing what their abilities are and mm -hmm. what they can really do for our nation. Um, I don't want to get back onto the whole political spectrum of those kind of things, but I think our, I think our legislators and I think our civilians need to really understand that we do have this national asset that both if we want to continue to fill the ranks of the DOD and have a an unbelievable, intelligent, well-equipped fighting force, it's going to take smart politicians um, to, to make sure we have that. As far as uh, the asset, the, the nation itself, if we can do this reintegration thing while, well and wisely, that these same people are one day going to become the next professor who's doing this type of interview, the next chancellor, the next little league ball coach, the next mayor, congressman, mm -hmm. local sheriff kind of thing. I'm not saying they're better than the civilians. I'm just saying it's an unbelievable group. It's about 9% of our entire civilian population in the U.S. are military veterans. I think we got to figure out how we can best help them to reintegrate. Maybe interviews like this and as you're talking to them, you might hear these younger people who uh, might have different aspects than what I've experienced but, um, but are searching for how can I continue to serve mm -hmm. now that I'm out of uniform. I think <coughs> it's a great study and a great thing that our nation needs to be really focused on. Well, thank you much for your time, Absolutely. Rob, and that. thank you for your service mm -hmm. over the years. Thank you.